From the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Bon dia. I'm uh, getting ready for my travels to Brazil, but couldn't miss couldn't miss another opportunity to be with you here in the pod. I also want to give a shout out. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah started last night. Yes, for... Happy Hanukkah, Buzzy. Oh, thank you. And also, um, in case anyone is wondering why Michael Davies is not here, you may have noticed a little oh, uh, a little, soccer. little little football happening yesterday, the finals of the World Cup. So uh, we're going to let him recover a little bit because, um, you know, that blazer is probably sweated through. Yeah, it's, it's had a lot of use in the last yeah. month and uh, he's ready to... To go back to just having nine jobs. Maybe. Yes, exactly. I don't, I don't know, but yeah, I'm in the holiday spirit. I have to say. Yeah, it's, are you getting uh, ready for? Yes, mm-hmm. I, I have been checking the lists twice. You know, making a list and checking it twice. Yes, doing that, doing that. <laughs> Both of my kids have been not naughty but nice. But yeah, I'm feeling, feeling the holiday spirit. Really excited to just have time with family over the next couple of weeks. We'll still be bringing you Inside Jeopardy, don't you worry, but we hope that you're all enjoying some time with your families as well. Whatever you celebrate, however you celebrate, I hope it's just a nice, enjoyable couple of weeks and that we head into 2023 feeling renewed and ready for a big year. Yeah. Well, we've already had an incredible start to the season, so I imagine you know, nothing is stopping 2023. That that year is coming like a bolt of lightning, and it will bring, I'm sure, more excitement. We already know about our high school reunion tournament. We're going to have more Celebrity Jeopardy, I believe. And, you know, the if the conservative, if we can, you know, maybe the conservative voices of Jeopardy will be a little hungover after their New Year celebration, and Michael Davies will throw even more insane things at us. Yeah, who knows what is in store, <laughs> but season 39 has been great so far. And last week, we finally saw an end to our streak of one-day winners with Sean McShane's impressive runaway performances. And we closed out the week with a two-day winner in Ray LaLonde. So let's get right into those game recaps. We started off the week with Matthew Ott going for his second win against Sean McShane and Chris Ann Bonifacio. Tough, tough final. I thought that was a tough final. What did you, what, how'd you feel about this one? Well, I didn't feel great. And I think <laughs> I think Sean was particularly happy when he saw this final that it was a runaway game for yeah. him and that he didn't need to come up with the correct response in order to keep that game a victory for him. So Sean starts our week with a great runaway. And that brings us to Tuesday's show where Sean is facing Brett Meyer and Ellen McRae. Yeah, and Ken in the open talks about, you know, Sean completed the ride of his life because he did bike 400 miles, we had learned in his first game. And now he's completed a win. He's completed something even better in a journey. He's yes. got a Jeopardy win. I think there is something, you know, we're, we're in this era of the super mega ultra champ. Uh, 21 wins. 40 wins. Yeah, 23, and, and you 38. Can, thir- yeah, you can forget that once you've won one game, you are a Jeopardy champion for, for life. life. And my feeling when I was on the show, I know we always make fun of me for bringing up what my experience was. I don't ever make fun of you. I think Michael Davies makes fun of you. Maybe. Okay. Okay. And Michael Harris likes to tease me a little I mean, bit. Okay. Well. Maybe, I may, maybe I do tease okay. you once in a while. But, <laughs> you know, I think beyond just that first time you buzz in and get your name called and answer right, if you if you are lucky enough to win a game... Everything after that kind of feels like gravy. I think, you know, some people certainly come in with with big goals and wanting to set records and all that. I think the majority of us who get to appear on the show, it's like, man, once you have that win, it's like, it's done. You know, you've done it. You're a Jeopardy champion for the rest of your life. Sean must have been feeling that because, you know, he comes in in the Jeopardy round. He responds to 16 clues. Oh, my gosh. He's heading into double Jeopardy with a huge lead. And he got to play a category like food as you might say it. <laughs> that was really fun. It's got buns, hun. The untidy Jose. Yeah, although being from New Jersey, northern New Jersey, a sloppy joe means something different for me. Um, okay, <laughs> tell me more. In northern New Jersey, a sloppy joe sandwich is actually a deli sandwich. Really? It's a three-layer deli sandwich. It's got two- Is it sloppy? It is sloppy. It's got two kinds of meat, uh, Swiss cheese, 
coleslaw, Russian dressing, originated at Town Hall Deli in South Orange, but also popular at other delis in the area, including the Milburn Deli. Um, it's it's really a, one of the greatest sandwiches ever created by one of the greatest. I would say here here I'm going to say it on the, on the podcast. One of the greatest creations by the hand of man or God is wow. the New Jersey Sloppy Joe sandwich. Um, Buzzy Sloppy Joe. And, yeah. But it still does got buns on, right? It's on rye. It's on it's okay. on thin rye bread. It's a totally different sandwich. It's got rye, guy. Yeah. But so, no? so the story is that it originated <laughs> at Slop, the Sloppy Joe Bar uh, in, in Havana. Um, and it had tongue and corned beef or something like that. Anyway. Wow. You lost but, me on that one. I don't know. Yeah. Greatest. All right. Greatest invention. But Sean and Ellen, they get through that category with ease. It's a fun moment for all. And then we have another cute moment on the Daily Double. Ellen gestures that she's going to put in all her chips. She goes, yeah. I want to do this. And she the just James. does a little James Holtzauer. But she does it so sweet and kind. It's yes. not quite the way James did it, but she does go all in. Unfortunately, she did lose 1400 on that. So it was early in the game. It was early, early and she got game. to say it, I think, just to be able to say, I want to go all in. Like, that's a Jeopardy highlight as well. Yeah, although it's interesting for me, it was saying true Daily Double. A lot of people like to say, I want to, you know, go all in is, is what they want. I want well, to you say played true. pre-James. I played so pre-James, So the, yeah. like, the poker chip all in move that James had kind yet of to be, brought. Had yet to bring itself yeah, into Jeopardy. Yeah, you didn't have that as an option. Well, the rest of the game, Sean was really in control. 18 buzzer attempts, of which he got 13, plus the two daily doubles was 15 correct responses. Back to back. Only went 3,000 on each of them, but again, enough for Sean to get his second runaway. Uh, Wagered a bit on a final that everybody got. Great final question. Love this bit of trivia about Frederick Douglass. Um, And that brings us... Sean is on a roll. It's like, are we having another Panulo who's just like a runaway... Uh, runaway train really uh, going through this game Um, Wednesday Sean's facing Dan Rosen and Molly Cowger yeah and he's now two for two like we said two wins two runaways trying to make it three kicks off the Jeopardy round and despite missing a four thousand dollar daily double he still manages to maintain a small lead heading into final Jeopardy so I think that says a lot about his gameplay and we learn yes in his interview we've kind of been thinking mcshane sean yeah. mcshane a little familiar oh yes in fact he has a cousin dan mcshane you may remember him four-day champ back in 2012 competed in our 2013 tournament of champions and he was a wild card semi-finalist mm. so a little family pressure for sean he's trying to match his cousin's success or maybe even surpass his cousin's yeah. success so playing well so far and jeopardy truly is you know a family affair for a lot of people there have been husbands and wives who have competed both um even um, fathers and daughters fathers and daughters sisters yeah sisters so it's you know cousins of course you know because this is a part of our lives you know if your grandma or grandpa watched the show both your cousins did too so um Sean could not be stopped, really. 16 successful buzz-ins in the double Jeopardy round. In spite of not getting a daily double, nearly a runaway, not quite, ends the double Jeopardy round with 23000 a $10,000 lead, but has to play this one because Dan could take this one in final. Yeah, Dan got that $3,000 daily double, so that, combined with him responding to a handful of those high-value clues, allowed this to not be a third runaway for Sean. Tricky final um, about uh, essentially asking about Woodrow Wilson, but Sean knew this one, so I'm, you know, very impressed. I did enjoy the little extra Q&A that Ken had with the audience about which was more stressful, hosting or being a contestant. Ken said that hosting is more stressful. Yeah, well, there's so many things. You know this from your own time as host. There's so many things you have to manage. Yeah. When you're a contestant, you're just focused on that game board. You're doing one thing. You're just clicking in, responding, clicking in, responding. But as the host, you are obviously happy to make sure you read every clue correctly. You have to be constantly aware of the scores and how each move impacts the gameplay, whether it's a daily double or ending the round and saying, wow, you came from behind and now you're in second. The timing of everything, trying to make sure you get through every clue. Like there is a lot to manage as host. You have me in your ear and that can't be fun for anyone. Um, So I wasn't surprised that he said that. Agree to disagree. But yeah, no, I mean, and it's also your, you know, I I think even if there's pressure as a contestant, it's also there's a lot more like moments of joy and fun and and all of that, which not that hosting is not fun and joyous, but, um, you know, you're, you're kind of, 
as you say, you're you're in a, a more removed role, so you're not you know kind of going through the you're not on the roller coaster ride, which you know roller coasters are fun. Well, Sean is on the roller coaster for sure. We're going to see how his fourth game goes, and we're going to introduce you to a new champion after a quick word from our sponsor. Ah, the best kind of notification. That's another sale on Shopify, the platform trusted by millions of entrepreneurs to create their online store and so much more. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. Start selling with Shopify and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. With Shopify, you'll customize your online store to your brand, discover new customers, and build the relationships that will keep them coming back. Shopify covers all the sales channels to successfully grow your business, from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify is here to help you succeed every step of the way. It's how every minute new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify, and you can too. I love how Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell their products anywhere, whether they're eBooks or eyewear. Shopify simplifies starting and running your own successful business, so when you're ready to take your idea to the world, do it with Shopify. Now it's your turn to try Shopify for free and start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash jeopardy. And now, back to Inside Jeopardy. We head into Thursday with Sean McShane going for that fourth win against Ali Kalman Wegner and Ray Lalonde. Um, Sean was in the lead going into Double Jeopardy with 11 correct responses, but Ray, who had 12 correct responses, was right on his tail. And I think, you know, we're going to talk about this in the in the viewer question section, but uh, I, I feel like Sean's style of play might be hurting him a little bit because, um, you know, the way that he plays doesn't give him the uh, control of the game board that leads him into these daily doubles. And here was another game where coming into this Jeopardy round, even though Sean is, is, has been on a tear, pretty, pretty evenly matched. Yes, 11 correct responses for him, 12 for Ray Lalonde. So we head into Double Jeopardy knowing this is not going to be a runaway for Sean, we don't think, and it's really just a close game. Even in the Double Jeopardy round, we have 12 correct responses from Ray and 10 correct responses from Sean. Um, yeah, they battled back and forth with those lead changes. Just, again, another ping-pong match Another ping-pong match. But, uh, you know, I think one thing that's working against Sean is his style of play going through the categories doesn't keep him in control when you need to be. And previous game, he only got that first uh, daily double in, in the Jeopardy round. This one, he got no daily doubles. And I think that that is uh, uh, clearly that's um, helping Ray uh, go from having a $2,000 lead to a... $6,000 lead. And Allie is very much in the mix as well in this game, but she misses that big, she mm. does find a daily double, but she misses that big $7,000 daily double to kind of put herself out of contention in this game. And Ray it, gets that $4,000 daily double, and that helps him take a small lead over Sean as we head into final. And again, you know, that's a $14,000 swing. Allie gets that, and we're talking about you know, Sean's in third with 16, but right on the heels of Allie with 18 and Ray with 22. Uh, you know, what what could have been? What could have been? This was a tough final for some if you're not a fan of the movie Die Hard. And if you don't consider it a Christmas movie, of course, the category action movies, it's the last line. If this is their idea of Christmas, I got to be here for New Year's. And I think Ken did confirm. Yes, Die Hard. It is a Christmas movie. Ken is really doing work up there, putting to bed these internet controversies. Pineapple belongs on pizza. Die Hard's a Christmas movie. Who knows what uh, internet controversy that I can't even remember he will deal with next. But um, Maybe in 2023. 2023. Who knows what will happen from Ken in 2023. We wrapped up the week with Ray Lalonde as our champion going up against Neil Gatling and Elizabeth Pontefract. I want to point out Ray Lalonde from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. You know, Toronto hasn't had much love, but then they had Matteo Roach. Yeah. So they're kind of on a a, a winning streak. And I'm sure um, I've heard from Matteo so much support from Canada. So let's see if Ray Lalonde 
comes into this game, second game, second runaway. Let's see if he can get some love from Toronto. Yeah. You know, the Canadians, they love they love this show. And who could blame them? But, you know, it's uh, I always I always keep a, a special eye out because it can be a little trickier because I the writing, it's not fully leaning American, but it's certainly a little more American. And, and, and Americans tend to have trouble with the Canadian geography, Canadian history mm-hmm. questions. So on one hand, maybe it's, you know, you don't maybe know the current senators from various U.S. states, but you would know uh, the capital of the Northwest Territories maybe better than someone from Boise, Idaho might. Not to diss on Boise, just saying. Um, In this Jeopardy round, Ray and Elizabeth very tightly matched, scoring 10 and 11 correct responses, respectively. Elizabeth just barely grabbing hold of the lead with $6,000 going into double Jeopardy. And I love Elizabeth's interview. We get to learn that she gave all of her dogs drag queen personas. <laughs> you know, Norma, a French bulldog who she called Norma Jean Barker. Lola, an English bulldog who she called Laverne and Surly. And of course, she does drag shows with them. I so just, I love I love Elizabeth. Elizabeth was having fun on the show, even having some fun reactions to getting clues correct. Like, oh, oh. yay. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's so much more fun for us as viewers to watch contestants who appear to be having fun on Jeopardy. So thank you, Elizabeth, for that. And I just want to shout out, we've got some new weekly highlights now. You can find those on the YouTube shorts. A really great look at just some of the best moments, the funniest moments from the week. So Elizabeth is sure to make the cut. Check those out. In uh, Double Jeopardy, Ray just absolutely turned it on. He had 17 correct responses, um, 73% buzz in attempt, ran the category Christmas and Hanukkah. Yeah, he's in the holiday spirit. Um, And he's certainly going to be happy uh, ho-ho-hoing home (laughs) with that runaway win, 23,600, going into final, the only one to get final correct, uh, and wagered 4,400, asking about the country with the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Yeah, this was interesting. I would not have thought Mm. Italy, such a small country, and yet so many. Yeah, well, maybe... uh, a lot to unpack there. A lot to unpack there. But, you know, I think the the real clues there were the volcano and the lagoon. Not a lot of countries famous for a lagoon. That's true. Neil, we haven't said too much about him, but uh, he ends with $193. Ken says, 193 I hope that's your lucky number. Neil responds, not anymore, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> what a week. Started with a short-lived but impressive runaway king, Sean McShane. And then... He's beaten by Ray Lalonde, who has his own runaway. So looking forward to next week and uh, these amazing shows, which I will be watching from uh, from a beautiful tropical beach somewhere. But I'll still be joining you on the pod. Yes, you will. And Ray, you know, he kind of liked to move back and forth during his <laughs> gameplay, which is difficult for our camera operators. So yeah. he may or may not have gotten the nickname from our social team of Ray the sway well if ray if you are on twitter um i hope you change your handle to ray the sway i love it and i say to you ray however it is that you win jeopardy you do you so enjoy the weekend as jeopardy champion that's it for our recaps let's head into viewer questions buzzy alex asks in a previous episode there was a brief discussion about the idea of controlling a game and how it can go hand in hand with bouncing around slash hunting for daily doubles. Do you think there is a correlation between this style of play becoming more popular and the recent influx of super champs such as Amy, Matt, Matea, and now Chris? Whereas in the past with top down play, someone could luck in quotes into daily doubles by being in the right place at the right time. You're the perfect person to answer this, Buzzy. Alex, that is a great question. I think, first of all, I want to say that there's a lot at play in the recent influx of super champs. Michael Davies and I have talked about this. We have some difference of opinions, but I think the point is that there's a lot of things going on, including people preparing more. And I think part of that preparation is being more strategic about clue selection. I think what happens is Let's say the the top half of the board, the you know two hundred, four hundred, six hundred dollar clue, or in double jeopardy for four hundred, eight hundred, twelve hundred dollar clue, those tend to be easier clues, right? So there's more chance of more people knowing them. So it eventually becomes a buzzer race where 
you start to have, as you get further down in the board, a little more differentiation in terms of knowledge base. That's also where you're going to tend to find the daily doubles. So I think that the top down, yes, makes it harder for you to be in control for longer. And really what you want a Jeopardy board to look like if you're a strategic player is at the end of the round, you've got your lead and there's only the top two rows left because then you're not in danger of losing that lead anymore. Um, there's there's also a huge advantage coming in, I think, as a returning champion, whether that's intimidation, familiarity, a combination of those things. You want to get to those high-value clues quickly while people are still finding their bearings. So I do think that this style of play is affecting the fact that we have more super champs because the people who are playing in this style they're able to stay in control when you come across the Daily Double. Very insightful, Buzzy. I'm trying to be. Thank you, you know. for that. Um, thank you, Alex, for that question. Find me on Twitter and I'll, I'll talk your ear off. Um, Doug asks, what was the reason for moving the category and clue for Final Jeopardy from the game board to its own separate screen? Was it to make the lives of the awesome Jeopardy crew easier? Was it so the contestants could see it better? When was the change made? Well, Doug, I love that you refer to our crew as the awesome Jeopardy crew. We certainly agree on that note. Basically, it was the result of a set change. Uh, Back in 2009, we added a monitor between where the contestants play and the host lectern. The monitor provided a lot of new opportunities to feature different things in it, one of those being the final Jeopardy category. It did allow for our host not to move over to the game board, but it just allowed us to have a different shot to show the final Jeopardy category larger in the monitor. And aesthetically, I think it was just great. But essentially, it did come about because of the set change. It didn't actually make it easier for the contestants to see it better. They still view the final Jeopardy clue in the game board across the stage. And of course, all of you at home see it full screen on your monitor. But um, yeah, change happens, even here at Jeopardy. (laughs) Hope I answered your question accurately, Doug. Thank you, Alex and Doug, for your questions. Listeners, as always, you can send in your questions to InsideJeopardyPodcast at gmail.com. And that wraps up our show. I want to wish everyone a very happy holiday. And we will see you here next Monday for a very special two-part Clue Crew episode. Oh, yes. Buzzy interviewed Jimmy McGuire and me to pay tribute to the Clue Crew. And I can't wait for all of you to hear it. Lots, lots was discussed and revealed. (laughs) So please make sure you subscribe, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And we'll see you all next week. Happy holidays.
For more great Jeopardy videos, hit the subscribe button below.